Please stand by. You will now be placed into conference. Let everybody know we're going to start um, at 12.05, so that's um, just two more minutes. And so welcome, everybody. This is Carol Alenza from the Maryland Coalition of Families for Children's Mental Health, now known as MCF. Um, occasionally, you're going to hear that little beep, and that's somebody coming on um, or leaving the session. Um, so just we just work through that. Um, the Maryland Coalition and the Institute for Innovation and Implementation at the School of Social Work at the University of Maryland um, are working together uh, on a regular basis to bring these webinars um, to families and uh, providers, school personnel, um, and when I say families, I'm including foster families and um, relatives uh, who are caring for children with uh, emotional and behavioral health challenges. Um, they are free, they're open to the public, and we try to bring on a regular basis, uh, generally every month, uh, new information, most up-to-date information, and we are fortunate uh, to have uh, partnerships with many, many experts in many fields that affect families and children in Maryland. Uh, so um, I'm just going to go over a little technical information so that you all know you're all muted. Um, and um, there is a chat feature uh, underneath the list of participants, and you can uh, send a chat message to the host or to the panelists. Um, or to the presenter, and uh, but not to each other, I, I believe. Um, and then uh, if you have any questions, you can chat them. Um, our presenters are going to take uh, a few minutes at the end of the presentation to be able to address your questions. Uh, but if you have something that's a burning question at that moment, please chat it, and, and we'll try to address it um, one thing is that this is being recorded, so please do not use anybody's name. Uh, respect uh, family members, including your child or children's uh, privacy. And also remember that this is uh, information for a number of people uh, because it will be recorded and, and will be on uh, the website at the university as well as at the Maryland Coalition, and so uh, people will be able to access this for many years, and so you want to be discreet in what you say um, in a recorded session. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, this month uh, is Children's Mental Health Matters. Um, we uh, had a campaign uh, for the first week of of May, and we had many events, um, and the theme uh, across the country uh, for children's mental health awareness is on bullying. Uh, so today we have bullying among children with disabilities. Our two speakers are Catherine Bradshaw, uh, Ph.D. M.E.D., who is a developmental psychologist and child mental health services and prevention researcher. She's an associate professor in the Department of Mental Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and has a joint appointment in the Johns Hopkins School of Education. She is also the deputy director of the Johns Hopkins Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence and the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Violence and Inter Early Intervention. She's an expert in bullying and youth violence prevention. She collaborates on federally supported randomized trials of school-based prevention programs and works with the Maryland State Department of Education and several school districts and national organizations to support the development and implementation of programs and policies to prevent bullying and youth violence. She has written over 100 papers and chapters on topics related to bullying, school climate, and youth violence prevention. She received a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers from the United States Office of Science and Technology Policy and Career Awards from the Society for Research in Child Development and the Society for Prevention Research. She has served on several expert 
panels on bullying, including the 2011 White House Summit on Bullying. And she has been a previous um, uh, presenter on the issue of bullying for the Maryland Coalition. So we're very grateful that she's uh, here again today. And co-presenting uh, with Dr. Bradshaw is Benjamin Zablowski, who is a Ph.D. candidate um, at the, in the mental health department at the Johns Hopkins School Public Bloomberg School of Public Health. Sorry. He holds a fellowship with the Institute for Education Sciences and a certificate in maternal and child health from the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health. He is a recipient of a school-wide dean's grant to conduct research in the field of developmental disabilities. His research focuses on children with autism spectrum disorders and their families. He has active collaborations with researchers at Kennedy Krieger Institute through the Maryland Center for Developmental Disabilities, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and the Interactive Autism Network, which includes the recent development and launching of a survey dedicated to the school and bullying experiences of children with ASD. And I welcome both uh, Dr. Bradshaw and Benjamin. Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting us uh, back to present for the group. Before, when I presented, I talked more generally about the issue of bullying, but I know a topic that is of great interest to the organization is children with disabilities, and so I invited Ben to join us today. And so he and I are going to share the presentation time. I'm going to start us with a bit of an overview of the contemporary research on bullying, including some definitional issues and some recent trends in the bullying research. And then Ben's going to pick up and talk about some of his research that he's been leading uh, in conjunction with Kennedy Krieger Institute on children with autism spectrum disorders. And then we are going to wrap up with some conclusions and recommendations. So in terms of defining the issue of bullying, we often think about this RIP model, as it's sometimes referred to, and the RIP comes from the repeated intentional and power characteristics of bullying. And so just to start off with the intentional aspect of it, so this differentiates kind of accidental forms of aggression that might hurt, uh, might occur in a friendship or where there's a, a brief falling out between kids over a disagreement. Um, rather, in a situation of bullying, we tend to see a general intentional pattern of, of repeated um, aggressive acts. The repeated aspect sometimes can be a little bit challenging for folks to pick up on, especially a situation of cyberbullying, for example, where you might send an email or a text message. And um, so in that case, the repeated nature of it could often be related to the youth who is sending multiple emails over time. And the power differential can often occur in a situation where there's a youth who's older or physically larger um, than others, than the victim. Um, in our case here where we're talking about children with disabilities, it very well could be where a typically developing child um, victimizes or targets a youth who has a disability, as we'll hear about in the example of children with autism spectrum disorders. Why focus on the issue of bullying? Well, there's been a lot of national attention to this issue, some of which has been related to some high-profile cases and specific incidents involving school violence or um, families and suicides that have occurred over the past few years. About two years ago, there was a situation of um, bullying of a child with a physical disability on a bus, and a parent got on the bus and ended up uh, harassing the kids that were the perpetrators, and I think that was one situation. Obviously, the parent didn't handle it very well, but it did draw national attention to the issue of children with disabilities um, who are disproportionately targeted for bullying. We've had a growing increase in the awareness of the negative impacts of bullying through the research, and we'll talk a little bit about some of that among typically developing kids as well as uh, youth with uh, disabilities. And uh, over the past about 10 years or so, um, all 50 states have passed laws specifically related to bullying. The state of South Dakota was the most recent. That law just passed in the month of March. And Maryland was, I believe, the seventh state to pass laws specifically related to the issue of bullying. I've been involved in some of those policy developments in conjunction with the Maryland State Department of Education 
Um, like other states, Maryland's law does have an emphasis on reporting and providing parents, youth, and teachers an opportunity to complete a form and report on bullying incidents that they experience. Um, the state has developed a model policy, and then the, each of the districts developed a policy to mimic that. And most of the um, policies have an emphasis on um, providing reporting opportunities, but don't outline as much and, and don't provide much in terms of resources for training and an emphasis on evidence-based prevention programming. So those are areas that we certainly need to work on with regard to our advocacy. And about 80% of the state laws address the issue of cyberbullying. In terms of prevalence, this is some data that we've collected from the state of Maryland, about 25,000 students that we've been monitoring since uh, 2005 around the issue of bullying. And we see that about half of youth, anywhere between 39% at the high school level and 48% at the elementary school level, say that they experienced bullying at least once within the past month. When we bump it up to look at frequent involvement in bullying, that means two or more times in the past month, uh, we see anywhere between 26% of high school students and about 31% of elementary school students. With regard to perpetration of bullying, um, it, and this question was asked about had youth ever perpetrated bullying, and we see that by high school, 50% of youth said that they had perpetrated incidents of bullying. With regard to witnessing, these numbers are very disturbing when we see that nearly 80% of high school students um, say that they had witnessed incidents of bullying within the past month. I often, when I'm talking about the issue of bullying, uh, encourage people to reflect back on a personal experience that they might have had because I find that that often helps them connect a little bit more with the material. And whether it's uh, their own personal experiences with bullying or someone in their family or that they've worked about clinically, um, we often find that folks say that they remember a lot of details, very vivid details about incidents of bullying and how it hurt them and um, how some youth do indicate that it kind of made them stronger in the long run from that experience. But generally we do see that even decades later, people will say that they remember quite great detail about incidents of bullying and it can be very harmful and, and maybe even resulted in some long-term effects for them. When we look at the breakdown based on some of the national data that we see about 30% of youth are frequently involved in bullying and that can be broken down into different roles that they play. Approximately 13% is the perpetrators of a, of a bullying incident, and about 11% is the victim, or some is referred to as a target of bullying. And then there's a third category of youth where you see that overlap. It's a relatively small group, about 6% of youth, that experience bullying as both a victim as well as a perpetrator. And one caveat I want to bring up here, and while we often refer to these kind of categorizations just for parsimony, it's important that we don't get into a situation where we're just creating more labels for youth. I think the area of children's mental health is really trying to move away from issues around um, grouping and labeling of youth. But this is a common approach that we take uh, when we're trying to understand the different types of behaviors or roles that youth can play in bullying. But as I mentioned, there is a larger group even that is involved in bullying primarily as a bystander. Is bullying on the increase? I often get this question, especially as we see a lot of attention to this issue in the media. And while that's been very important for us to acknowledge the issue of bullying and um, capitalize on these moments where we do have teachable moments or have high-profile cases, the national data suggests that bullying does not appear to be on the increase. The only form that does appear to be on a slight increase is cyberbullying, and that's the use of electronic forms of, of aggression. So things like text messaging, emailing, um, even uh, phone calls are considered kind of a low-tech version of cyberbullying. And generally the reason why we think that there's an increase here is because that youth have greater access to these forms of technology and much of that access is unsupervised, like parents aren't able to monitor their children's use of the Internet or phones 24-7. There's also an issue of sexting that appears to be on the increase. Um, we've seen some of these examples, sadly, among youth as well as among adults, but sexting is the sending of sexually explicit uh, photos that typically have a, a youth who is nude or partially nude. And in many cases, this starts out as a consensual 
exchange where a youth might send um, a photo of themselves where they're to a romantic partner or somebody they're interested in being romantic with. But when that relationship dissolves or if the youth doesn't take care of that um, information and, and shares it with others, it can very easily get turned around and used in situations of cyberbullying. I just highlight it because I think it's an issue where we need to have parents starting to talk more with their kids about Internet safety and Internet use and what are appropriate messages to send and how to handle these. There are also some situations where youth can become, um, that they can come in contact with these images and not really know how to handle them and they could um, very well turn into some legal issues if they're not careful. In terms of some of the effects of bullying, we know from about uh, 12 to 13 years or so of pretty solid research around the issue of bullying that there are a host of potential effects of bullying. And just focusing here on the academic and engagement ones, since many of the youth are school age that are experiencing um, bullying. I've noted whether it is common among a, a victim with a B and a P if it's common among a perpetrator, but as you'll see from this list here with regard to the academic outcomes, these are common among both perpetrators as well as victims. And it includes things like absenteeism, dislike of school or feeling unsafe at school, which can lead to low participation and low academic achievement. And generally, high rates of bullying are associated with a negative school climate and youth feeling disengaged from the school environment. When we shift over to look at some of the physical symptoms, and this might also be a bit common among our younger youth, uh, children in elementary school, as well as youth that have disabilities and may not be able to express what's happening verbally um, to adults, they might be more likely to develop some psychosomatic complaints like headaches, problems sleeping, bedwetting, abdominal pain, other kind of uh, unexplained physical illnesses that don't appear to have a, a medical source. And finally, we have a host of social-emotional problems, including anxiety and depression, which are common among victims of bullying. Uh, perpetrators of bullying, we tend to see more aggressive behaviors and attitudes in general from those youth. And um, sadly, suicidal ideation is common among, uh, or not necessarily common, but a potential risk among youth that are perpetrators as well as victims of bullying. And if these are left untreated um, and co-occur with other mental health concerns, we can be very, um, they could be at risk for suicidal behavior. In terms of developmental differences, we see a general trend whereby there's a peak in the rates of bullying towards the middle school years, and so that would be youth around 12, 13, 14 years of age. Except cyberbullying, that does appear to be one form that continues to increase through the high school years. Um, relational forms are things like social aggression, exclusion, uh, rumor spreading, things like that that are more relational or social or verbal in nature as compared to physical forms of bullying, like hitting, pushing, threatening. The relational forms do tend to persist beyond the physical forms, so we tend to see higher rates of relational forms in high school than we do among the physical forms in high school. However, there's been relatively little research on younger children, um, so children three, four, five uh, years of age. There's been some interesting programming that Sesame Street has recently been doing for this younger population, but they don't necessarily use the word bullying, but they definitely hone in on issues around peer victimization and um, how youth can respond to that. So if you're interested in checking out some of those resources, you can go to the Sesame Street website and download the um, episode of Sesame Street where Big Bird gets bullied. And they even have a parent compendium that will give parents some ideas about how they can view it with their children and facilitate some dialogue around it. But with regard to younger children, one area we see some early signs of bullying is what's referred to as rough and tumble play, which can get a little... Um, that's very common for younger kids, and that's an important developmental process of learning boundaries and impact of one's behavior. But sometimes that can cross a line, especially among peers or uh, as well as siblings. So it's important for parents to keep an eye out of some of these early aggressive behaviors that could translate into um, a more persistent pattern of aggression or bullying behavior. There are some gender differences that the research has identified. We see that both boys and girls engage in 
relational forms of, of bullying, those social forms as I mentioned. However, we do see that girls generally are more upset by those relational forms of, of victimization, uh, whereas boys tend to be more upset or sensitive to the physical form. There um, is some indication that cyberbullying may be a little more common among girls. I think it's because it's an indirect form and they don't have that face-to-face -face contact. So there are some uh, of these gender differences which are consistent with the stereotypes. In terms of ethnicity and diversity factors, we know that ethnic minority youth are more likely to report victimization. However, they may not be as likely to label it bullying. I think we as a society have developed a certain image or schema of what bullying is, and sometimes youth feel that that doesn't pertain to the kind of experiences that they have. We did a study in the Baltimore area where we looked at African-American students compared to Caucasian students and found that the African-American students experienced higher rates of victimization, so they were getting beat up and having rumors spread and other kinds of various forms of victimization. But when we asked them a few questions later on the survey, were they actually bullied, they were considerably less likely than their victimized white peers to label it bullying. So we think that there might be some cultural differences in the way that youth, as well as families, conceptualize the term bullying that are important for us to keep in mind when we go to talk about intervention and prevention efforts. LGBT youth, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered youth, as well as youth that are gender nonconforming, and that would be boys that may not dress in a way that's typical for um, social expectations of boys, and similarly for girls not dressing in a typical uh, way for girls to dress, that those youth are at greater risk for victimization. And the gender nonconformity piece um, holds up regardless of their sexual orientation. So even if the youth are straight and just gender nonconforming, we still see higher rates of victimization than among their peers. In fact, some of the estimates suggest as high as 85% of youth that are LGBT have experienced uh, peer victimization and harassment. There are also important issues for us to consider related to parental support among these youth because sadly, sometimes at home, their parents may not be very supportive of their sexual orientation or their dress or the way that they're interacting with their peers. So we have to be particularly cautious in how we engage their parents around this issue. And we also know that suicidal ideation is um, a risk factor among youth that are uh, struggling with issues around sexual identity development. And so not to suggest that the bullying causes the suicide per se, but rather in a situation where there are pre-existing mental health concerns and some issues around lack of parental support or challenges with regard to sexual identity development, those youth, the kind of accumulation of those risk factors could lead to some concerns related to suicide. I'm going to turn it over now where we're going to hear from Ben about some of his work and some of the research around children with disabilities and their risk for victimization. Great, thank you, Catherine. The past literature regarding bullying has almost exclusively been within a regular education population. In fact, there have only been approximately 50 studies that have been dedicated to bullying looking at a special education population. And there needs to be more, considering that every year approximately 6.5 million children in the United States are receiving special education services. And this translates to roughly 1 in 10 children. The challenge with conducting research of bullying within a special education population is that there can be a variety of presentations in terms of the children's disabilities. These are typically captured through the child's IEP, and there can be up to 13 different diagnoses listed as the reason for the IEP. Children with various disabilities might have differing levels of inclusion in regular education. So that's another challenge researchers deal with when they do research and bullying within a special education population. However, despite these varying presentations, there are characteristics that are shared within a population of children with disabilities. Children typically present with social skills deficits, which can include difficulty in interpreting social stimuli, which can also result in misreading social communication. Now, these social skills deficits sometimes translate into difficulty making friends, 
and those children who do maintain friendships might have difficulty maintaining a high level of friendships and a high number of friendships. Children who are bullied and have disabilities subsequently occupy lower social statuses within the school hierarchy, and that unfortunately makes them a target for bullying, and children might find themselves not wanting to associate with these children for fear that they might become a target for bullying as well. There was a great uh, review, I mentioned there are roughly 50 studies dedicated to special education and bullying. Rose and colleagues did a great review of the articles that are currently available, and they found that there are really two main predictors of bullying within this population, and these include the level of the disability being observable and the severity of the disorder. Sometimes these two can go hand in hand. Children with noticeable disorders presented with the highest risk of being bullied, that is, children with autism or children with a specific physical disability. Children who had specific learning disorders actually appear to be at the lowest risk compared to these other disabilities. The severity of the disability also relates to this level of bullying, as I mentioned, and it also can predict their level of inclusion in regular education, which could play a prominent role in their risk for being bullied. Catherine has mentioned a lot of the consequences of bullying among a regular education population. The literature dedicated to this within a special education population finds very similar results. One thing that I wanted to focus on was the long-term consequences of bullying within children with disabilities, and one of the greatest risks might be that these children develop aggressive behaviors themselves and subsequently might become bullies. Children who have a pre-existing emotional behavioral disorder are at the greatest risk, and children who do spend some time in regular education and then move towards a segregated setting might carry over bullying behaviors to that new setting. One of the greatest concerns is that children who are frequently bullied become more afraid to tell a parent about being bullied the more they're bullied, so this allows bullying to perpetrate itself. So switching gears slightly, Catherine Bradshaw, myself, Paul Law, and members of the Interactive Autism Network developed a survey to look at bullying within children with an autism spectrum disorder. We titled our survey, The Bullying and School Experiences of Children with ASD Survey, and it was launched through the Interactive Autism Network which is an online national web-based registry for families to go to to share their experiences of raising their child. Currently, there are roughly 24,000 families, which translates to 14,000 children who have been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. The survey itself was launched in 2011, and roughly 1,200 families, and I should say their parents, filled out the survey about their child with an ASD. The goals of the survey included determining the rate of bullying with a sample of children with ASDs. We are very interested in identifying potential school and child level predictors of bullying behaviors. We also wanted to focus on what locations bullying is occurring in and then compare these findings to previous studies dedicated to children with disabilities, looking at level of inclusion and the observable nature of the disability. So our sample was predominantly white and male, which is typically what you see in the literature dedicated to autism. We had a nice range of the spectrum, that is to say, that children with Asperger's represented roughly 25% of the population, children with autism were 40%, and the other category included PDD and PDD-ONOS, and we had roughly 36% of those participants with that disorder. In terms of school characteristics, the children predominantly came from public schools and from schools where it was a regular education population. That is to say, it wasn't a special school, special needs school. The majority of the subjects come from elementary and middle schools with only about 12% in high school. So this slide shows the rate at which children had been bullied by others in the past month. Frequent is two or more times in the past month, infrequent is one or less times, and never is never uh, in the past month or ever for that case. And we found that children with Asperger's turned out to be at the greatest risk of being victimized in the past month at a frequent basis, with almost 50% bullied two or more times. Children with autism were at the lowest risk, but still 20% were being victimized two or more times, and other ASDs represented about 25% 
or frequent victims. If we look, if we scroll down to the school setting, you see that children in public schools were actually bullied at a greater rate than children in private schools, and children in regular education schools were bullied at a greater rate than children in a special education school. If we focus even more into the regular education schools, we find that children who were in full inclusion settings were actually bullied at the greatest rate compared to children who were primarily in exclusion. That is, roughly 38% of children who are in full inclusion in regular education schools were victimized two or more times in the past month. We explored risk factors for both being a bully in the past month, being a victim in the past month, and being a bully victim in the past month. This first slide here is showing you the risk factors for being bullied in the past month. And you can see how some of the findings from the previous slides carry over, that children with, who have been diagnosed with Asperger's were at the greatest risk of being bullied in the past month. Children were also at a greater risk if they had comorbid psychiatric conditions, which included depression, anxiety, ADHD, conduct disorder, oppositional defiance disorder. Children who were bullied in the past month also had high levels of autistic traits. That is, we provided the parent with a checklist of a series of stereotyped and repetitive behaviors and had them endorse which ones the child exhibited. And the ones at the highest levels had the child with the greatest risk of being bullied in the past month. These children also had difficulty making friends. And in terms of the school, you see they were in a public school, in a regular education population school, and attending a middle school. Moving to children who bullied others in the past month, there were a few predictors, but they included children who had those high autistic traits and children who had difficulty making friends. Children who were both bullies and, bullies and victims in the past month were the most likely to be diagnosed with Asperger's, have comorbid psychiatric conditions, to have difficulty making friends. That was a trend across all these groups, that the children who exhibited these social skills deficits actually had the greatest risk of being involved in bullying. And I should note that there were more children who were actually both bullies and victims in the past month than children who were bullied alone, which might have something to do with these children exhibiting retaliatory efforts. We moved over to wanting to understand better where victimization was occurring. So this slide is showing you various locations across the school where victimization could occur. And parents were asked to list any location that the child had been bullied. So that's why you see the percentages add up to more than 100. One thing that is somewhat disturbing is that we're seeing that in the classroom itself, 52% of the bullying occurs. And this is, might be a situation where there are a greater number of opportunities for bullying, but still the fact that 52% of children who were victimized reported being victimized in the classroom is, is a bit concerning. If we look at other settings within the school, moving from the gym to the cafeteria to the playground, you see <laughs> playground, you see a greater risk for victimization. And part of that might have to do with the level of supervision that's available in each of those settings, with playground and recess time being one of the least supervised times at school. A concerning finding was that roughly 40% of children who reported victimization reported it on the school bus. And the thought of a child being bullied before they even enter the school doors in the morning and then being bullied before they even get home is, is, is concerning to us. So some conclusions. We found that the children with the most observable ASDs were at the greatest risk, and these were the children with Asperger's disorder who had high levels of autistic traits. It seemed that the children who spent a lot of time in inclusion settings were at a greater risk of being bullied. Children who were victimized themselves were at a greater risk of bullying others, and we found that level of supervision may relate to the opportunity of being bullied, and that could include the playground and recess time, and we're particularly concerned about the school bus being an instant and location where bullying may occur at a high rate. So some general recommendations. We want to make sure we ensure children with disabilities are placed who are placed in inclusive settings have sufficient support to thrive in the classroom. There are obviously many, many benefits for an inclusive setting, including academic success and social skills development, but it's important at the same time to make sure that a child who is integrated into a classroom 
has those supports necessary to make sure they can thrive. It's important that we increase supervision across all school settings to prevent bullying, but particularly in settings where there currently isn't a high level of supervision, which can include the school bus and, of course, the playground and recess time. It's important that we identify children with disabilities who may be at particular risk for victimization. These can include, in this situation, children with Asperger's. And it's important that we adapt anti-bullying curriculum to address children with disabilities. One in ten children are presenting with a disability in the school. We need to make sure we adapt our curriculum to support these children and make sure we're looking out for them. This final slide, I want to acknowledge the Interactive Autism Network team, which includes Paul Law, Connie Anderson, and, of course, all the families participating. I think at this point we'll open it up for questions, and our contact information is listed on this slide. Um, all right, so if we want, because we do have some time, um, if you could um, raise your hand, and I just clicked on mine to raise my hand. There's a little um, icon with a hand, and, and um, we can unmute you, and you can ask a question. Okay, so Julie. Um, now, I can't unmute, so Adam, go ahead. Julie, go ahead. You're on. Okay. Um, yeah. How how can we, um, if we are advocating for family members who um, have a child being bullied in the school system, how is the best way to advise the parent on how to approach that as they have advised that they're approaching the school with it, but it, nothing is being done? Right. Well, the state of Maryland has the Safe Schools Reporting Act, so there's actually a form that if, even if they're um, in a public school as well as a private school, many of the private schools have adopted a similar type of form that provides an opportunity for parents and family members to document incidents of bullying and a required field on that form is how the administrator followed up. And that data gets summarized and forwarded up to the district level as well as the state level. So um, I think there's variation in implementation of that policy, and I think a lot of parents aren't really aware that that's available to them. But you can go to the Maryland State Department of Education and download a copy of that form. And all the school districts, I believe all of them, have a link to that form also on their home page. So that's one way that you can ensure that there's at least a paper trail and that requires the follow-up documentation. Um, in terms of uh, reaching out to specific individuals, that form goes to the principal within the school and requires administrative action. But we also recommend that, staff, that parents reach out to individual teachers where the bullying is happening because our research indicates that sometimes teachers don't even realize that it's happening in the classroom setting. Guidance counselors or the school psychologists are also another good resource within the building. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I do have a question here uh, that somebody chatted. It says, are teachers actually documenting the bullying that is happening in their classroom? There's variation in that. Um, so the, the form requires the opportunity for them to do that. However, districts vary in terms of the extent to which they provide training and expect staff to document every single incident of bullying. So I know many of the schools use office discipline referral forms to document problems that happen in the classroom, and bullying is one of those features on the form, so that way it can get tracked as such. Bullying is also a code for suspension, so we can track at the state level how many suspensions are occurring. But I think there's variation in terms of the extent to which the individual teachers are documenting incidents of bullying. Um, but when we do our prevention programming in schools, we use surveys similar to the one that we had used with the project that then described, where we encourage school staff as well as students and parents to complete an annual survey about rates of bullying. So that way we can provide data directly back to the schools about what this looks like and where it's happening and who all is involved. The surveys are anonymous because that's important for us to be able to get honest answers on the surveys. 
Um, other schools also have mechanisms like a drop box where kids will drop a note into the guidance counselor or the school psychologist to report on bullying that they're aware of and, and want to make the school staff knowledgeable about that. So there are a variety of different ways that we try to collect information on race and bullying um, to get different perspectives on the issue. Okay. Do we have any other questions? I have one. Um, so uh, my question is that um, oftentimes in an IEP um, for a child who has an IEP, the um, child study team will include specific training that teachers and support staff are required to have that are directly related to the child's disability and, uh, you know, to help um, understand it better and as well as to um, help the child um, to learn and grow. Would um, bullying training be an appropriate um, intervention or training requirement in an IEP for those people who are involved with children who uh, then showed were more likely to be bullied or to be bullies or to be both? That's a long that's, question, but... <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really great suggestion. We recommend universal training around bullying prevention for staff, that all staff get professional development. Uh, and But I think highlighting it in an IEP is particularly important for those vulnerable populations, especially if you see that a pattern, one pattern of their behavior includes bullying either as a target or as a perpetrator. So I have not seen that in the IEPs or heard that very much from the folks that we work with that are school-based around this issue, but I think that's an excellent suggestion. But generally, we recommend professional development for all staff and that a portion of that professional development address special needs populations. Thank you. Okay. Um, Donna Norton has a question. Yeah. Okay, Donna, go ahead. Thank you. My question is, a lot of the children that have the special needs, especially with the autism and stuff, their communication levels are not... Um, they're slightly lower than, you know, your regular population. How would a parent, this, I think these kids would be less likely to be able to communicate that they're being bullied. So how would you go about getting that information from those? What strategies could be used to get that information from the children? Also considering the fact that they might not understand fully what bullying is. Yeah, that, that's one of the greatest challenges, I think, conducting research within the population of children with autism spectrum disorders because really you can see a huge range of children who are very high-functioning, have a, don't really have much difficulty at all communicating with their teachers, with their parents, or with their peers, and the children who might be very severely impaired, might be nonverbal, and can't communicate very easily a bullying episode. Children on the spectrum also could easily misinterpret it, as you mentioned, a bullying episode as not being a bullying episode. They might misinterpret horseplay as being aggressive. There really is a lot of fluctuation between what the child is, is seeing and what they're then interpreting. And the greatest way, at least within our study, what we want to do is really be sensitive to that idea that children with Asperger's might at the same time be able to report at a higher rate and communicate to their parents they're bullying. For the lower functioning children, we really are dependent on the teachers, and our recommendation really is that we need to encourage teachers to report bullying when they see it and be sensitive to these children who have disabilities who can't necessarily speak for themselves, and that's going to be incredibly important for the lowest functioning children and the children who do have more severe disabilities, whether it's autism or not, and may struggle to communicate to the proper adults. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions? I don't see any other. Any other chat? No. Um, okay, one more opportunity for questions. 
Well, I think that because you guys did such a terrific job of explaining and uh, breaking down everything and, and the research and the current research and the work that you both are doing is just wonderful. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we will have um, questions later on that uh, might be uh, directed to Dr. Bradshaw or to Benjamin directly at their web, uh, their emails, and the emails are on the uh, last page here. Um, also, I wanted to just um, confirm with uh, both of you that um, that we are able to send out the PowerPoint um, along with the uh, actual presentation because we'll send them uh, a link so that people can go back to look at it, and there are a number of people who had contacted me that were not able to attend today, and they wanted to be able to see this and hear it. Uh, so is, do I have? Yeah, that's fine. And, and while we have a minute or two, we can make some ref, uh, suggestions and other resources people might find interesting. Um, the U.S. federal government has come together for several different federal agencies and has a website called stopbullying.gov. It's all one word, so www.bullying.gov, that has a lot of information for parents, youth, and advocates around the issue of bullying, including some research and tip sheets about what to do if you see bullying happening. There's another organization that does research and provides technical assistance, a little more focused on children with disabilities, and that's called PACER, P-A-C-E-R, the PACER Institute. You can Google PACER, P-A-C-E-R, and bullying, and you can uh, pull up their website and get some additional information. There's also a summary of the study that Ben talked about on the Kennedy Krieger Institute website that provides a little bit more information on the survey results that shared, so you're welcome to access that. Um, and there have been, that was kind of more of like a research brief that is available, and we can send some of those links on to Carol, and that way when you send out the uh, information from the PowerPoint here, you can add on a page about some of these references or resources. That, that would be wonderful. Great. Well, if we don't have any other questions, we uh, will say goodbye to our uh, attendees and our uh, presenters, and um, I can't thank you each. Uh, enough, all of you, uh, attendees and presenters, uh, for your contributions uh, to advocacy and to education for families and for children in Maryland. Um, this is a, a wonderful state to live in because there is so much collaboration um, throughout the state. And I thank you so much, Dr. Bradshaw and Benjamin, um, for uh, participating and presenting today. Thank you. Sure thing. Thanks for inviting okay. us. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.